Hey, this is Steve Staley, voice of Neji Huga from Naruto, and you are watching Spoiler Force. All right, so this is episode 165 of Spoiler Force Podcast. My name is Ricky, and thank you for tuning in. This week's guest is an actor and director. He voices Neji Huga from Naruto, uh, Hitsu, Hitsugaya from Bleach, and also Ippo from Hajime no Ippo. Let me bring my guest here, Steve Staley. Thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, hi there. Great to see you. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, you know, um, like all like all the voice actors I bring on the show, I'm always very uh, appreciative, but also surprised because when I emailed you uh, initially, we were having a little bit of the the communication problem because like I I, I had to send I sent it to your I didn't want to send it to your Instagram because you know sometimes folks don't reply through there. So when I sent it to your email and then I waited a while, and then when I sent it, uh, the message on Instagram, you're like, send it to me again. Let me see if I got it. And then we finally worked it out. So I just, I thought that was very, um, very funny in a way just to finally get you on the show, man. But I, I, again, I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, thank you. I, the reason for that is I could have sworn you sent me an email. And in fact, you said you <laughs> did. And I knew that because I could have sworn I saw it. And then when I went back, because sometimes those things go kind of low, you know how it is. I I couldn't find it, and I, and I and I knew that it had a certain name. I think I even went back and looked at Insta or whatever it was to see the name. And that's when I typed you and said, "Whatever you sent me, I did not. It is gone." <laughs> Which was weird, aside from any of this, that I I saw it, and you said you sent it, and I could not find it, even in trash. I don't know how it worked, but anyway, <laughs> he, here we are. Yeah, uh, you know, you're actually one of like another Naruto guest that I've had on the sh that I'm having on the show because you know I, I had the like the the honor to speak with like Tom Gibbis, Michael Yershak, Brian Donovan. You know, and, and Great. for me, Naruto has been like one of the animes that I grew up with, and for me, it's the number one anime for me. Whenever I recommend it for folks who want to watch it, whether it's in sub or dub. You know, and to have you on that list of Naruto actors to speak with, man, I, it's just very surreal for me. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know what? How, you know, five, six, seven hundred episodes. That's your entire childhood. You know, for the for the fans who may not know, man. So, Steve, how did you initially get this role of Neji Hyuga, man? Because this this character is a fan favorite. And I'm, of course, we will we will be touching up on his uh, sad fate in the show. <laughs> Well, I um, I had already been uh, doing voiceovers with an agent and all the things that are out here that kind of don't have anything to do with dubbing. Um, and through the community of actors is how I got to meet people who were in the, the world of dubbing. And um, I think in that way made it into a casting director named Jamie's little black book right and then i got the call for the audition and went over to what i used to call the veritel building which only means something to me or people who've lived in la for a long time and uh went up to his old studio which at the time was called studio e and there were all the sides laid out on the table and if i recall well maybe they told us what to audition for but there used to be a thing where you'd see all the sides and you would pick the ones you thought you were right for and then take those inside i don't remember if it was one of those, but, um, I do remember the, the audition. I remember going up there for that and auditioning and, um, I gotta be honest. I don't remember hearing back or hearing, you know, that I got the part and let alone knowing what I was getting myself into. Uh, I'm sure what happened was I just got a call for work. Um, and then went to work and they explained it to me and we, listened to the original and figured out how I was going to do it. And then we started. Did you ever think like this was going to be like that long of a running show when you first got this character? No, like, anything even the, else just... I'd ever done was only, you know, 13 episodes, maybe 25. I had no idea. And even having like any the... of us did. <laughs> <laughs> and even the movies as well, like, you know, with the Naruto movies, there's there's so many of them. And a lot of these characters keep coming back in, in these uh, in the movies as well. So, like, you yeah, know, new voicing new voicing Neji was, uh, you know, an, another big part. And when it comes to like the, the, the support characters for Naruto's and especially in the movies, uh -huh, the movies and the video games, all yeah. of them. Now, 
you know, were you able to um, audition for any other characters when you uh, auditioned for Neji initially, or you just kind of selected who you wanted? I probably did because that was the kind of audition. Like if the sides were all laid out on the table, mm -hmm. then that means I probably did read for more than one character. I would, I don't have any idea who, or maybe not. <laughs> it, it could have been one where they said, here's the, here's the parts we think you were right for. So that I don't, I don't, uh, remember, but the chances are good that I also read for some other parts because that's how that, what I'm describing, that's how that usually goes down. Now, as as the show, you know, progressed and in, even into like Shippuden and even like with the streaming services, you know, how, how was your reaction to seeing like this resurgence, resurgence of Naruto again? Yeah, I would agree that there has been a resurgence. And of course, it's thanks to streaming where I, I maybe even back at the beginning of Naruto, people were still having to buy uh, DVDs if they wanted to watch anything on anime. Um but for streaming to come around and go hard into anime and not only that, but have all of Naruto just there to watch. It's been evident that there's a resurgence, mostly because the fans, the original fans like yourself are grown up. But then when there's 10 and 11 year olds who like Naruto, it's obvious that they're coming to it through streaming and they're not thinking of it as old because it's right there on their TV. Yeah, and I, I've spoken with like you know again with with like Tom Gibbs and, and Michael Yershek about this. Too. Like just seeing this generational thing where you see kids who grew up who are having kids watching Naruto, and then there's also like just the con events when you go and meet right. them. Right, and then that's having, how I like, know from meeting people. Yeah, and then like just you know when you go to these events like this, and when they have large groupings of like the cast of certain shows. And you just see how everyone reacts to this. Like, you know, this is this character. This, he voiced this character. They voiced this character. You know, is this still pretty surreal to you going to these events and seeing it in person like that? Um, to a degree, it is. Because keep in mind, Naruto lasted for 12 years. And so that was 12 years from the beginning of it. So here we are practically 20 years later. So the surreal part of it I've, I've learned to deal with, but I sure find out how important it is to people when I'm out or someone shows me a tattoo that they have of it or, you know, the way people who I interact with talk about it. And so I know that it's uh, impactful in a way that before may have seemed surreal, but now I, uh, I just, I understand that we're part of something bigger than our part of it that we did when we just went to the studio now you know for, for when you voiced neji were you were you able to read like the manga at all when you were doing this or did, were you even aware of the manga i could have and every time i was at barnes and noble i would pass by and go look at all these books that's naruto <laughs> that's the show i'm on i would say to my friends and they wouldn't be that interested so i did not read it but i i looked through it and and, and i'm uh, completely aware of it were there like I guess characteristics of Neji that you felt like you related to as well like growing up with this character essentially as well from like the Naruto series to Shippuden well you kind of just find a way to relate to it no matter what the character is right because that's the job and so we would see these episodes and I would understand what's going on you know what what this is about for him and then call on those parts of myself to bring it forward uh, as Neji and then also taking into consideration what the uh, original did, because that's a concern to the to management, if that makes sense. They they we want it to be similar. Yeah, I I know that um, you know you only get to watch like certain parts as you're voicing these characters because you have to match the mouth flaps, and then uh, you have to kind of just convey the same emotions as well but i guess for, for you steve was, was there anything that was a bit challenging with neji at all when you were voicing this character anything that was a little bit conflicting no because the dark side of him uh and by that i just mean his brooding seriousness that was uh, fun to go into so it, it was more like 
playing around, I got to go be this serious guy rather than try to figure out or look for a way in, if that makes sense. I, I got to just be that serious guy, you know, play, play the moment for what it is. And that's a great way to to kind of describe him as well, being serious, because, you know, even in one of my favorite arcs is when he uh, when he joins Naruto Shikamaru for the Sasuke retrieval arc. And then that where you see like his character really change from is this uh, what I always refer to as Sasuke in the darkness. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a good one. Yeah. You know, just seeing Neji fight Kitomaru, man. How is that like when, when you were watching this as dub, you were dubbing this, what was going through your mind seeing him fight this guy one V one? And like telling his friends, like, I got this, you know. Well, the truth is, remember, I'm looking at it technically not as an audience member because mm -hmm. I have work to do. So if I'm watching these scenes, I'm not looking for Steve's feelings. I'm looking for what's Neji up to and how is he feeling. And so I'm having to prepare by watching those fights so that I can catch the sync of the movements um, in relationship to the original preview and then connecting more with how Neji is feeling, if he's angry or, um, vengeful, whatever's going on in, in him while he's having this fight. So I, I never really thought about fights like that from an, a, an overview or canonical point, meaning how they are, what it means to the, all of Naruto. It was more like, how is Neji feel in in this moment, period? No before, no after. What's going on right now? And how do you communicate that the fullest? You know, seeing seeing especially this part of, of the show where, where Neji nearly dies fighting yeah. uh, the villain, you know, what again, what, what was going through your mind when you were just seeing this? Was it just something you were just reacting to or in, in your mind, like I guess in a way, like maybe, maybe did you see that as like an audience member, like, oh man, this is like going to be a very impactful part because it goes from like very, uh, you know, very fighting wise, just him and, and the, the villain going at each other to where he's finally like thinking back to what he, how much he's changed and how much Naruto has changed him as well. Right. All of that is part of that arc. And I mostly was, uh, as far as I can remember, you know, we spent a lot of time on Sasuke in the darkness, and I was mostly interested to see how this was going to work itself out. You know, what would end up, what, what would end up happening, you know, and um, happy to see that I got to be featured in these battles and um, do something monumental. Little did I know it was going to happen later on, but uh it was gratifying as an actor to see that. And then again, remember, we're at work. I'm not, I don't have time to think about those other things. It's, I got to come up with it. I got to scream at the top of my lungs or be angry or cry. I got to, you know, I got to, I'm, I'm focused on how I am going to execute that, uh, produce that uh, within one or two takes for the work that we're doing, you know? It's just a, the different side of it than the uh, plot. Yeah, I think that's really uh, that's a very good take too. Just to see that you know how actors have to adjust to the what you, what you're given. Because again, you know, speaking with so many different actors, like they just have there's everyone has their own take on how they uh, act or like different acting styles or how they portray these characters. And you know, and for me, it's a very it it's, it is. I wouldn't say it's hard to understand, but like as an audience member and as a fan, it, a lot of us tend to be like, how is it like to, you know, do this? And how is it like, what was your thoughts on this? So, you know, to hear how an, an actor's experience or put into like an actor's perspective on how you guys do these shows. It's very eye opening as well. Like it's not always just, you know, what the fans Yeah, I'm think. not really ever thinking about the plot yeah. and the, the director is there to say things like, you know, remember, this is all started with Hinata, blah, blah, you know, that, that yeah. kind of thing. And to keep it uh, trackable, but the lines are already written and the story is already told. We have to fill in these moments one at a time 
in the middle of it. And that requires an effort on our part that is separate from the plot. You got to dig into yourself to find out where you're going to do that. You got to take a deep enough breath. You got to be ready to go. You got to chase it down what you're seeing on the screen and, and hit it just right and not go off mic. You know, the, the technical aspects of, of executing this in the, in the room in order to get the impact that you're talking about. Were there any moments then that you felt like was uh, more difficult when it came to Neji's part in the show? Was there any like particular scenes, if you remember, that maybe uh, you kind of struggled with? No, no um, only the screaming that would get out of hand. <laughs> you know what I mean? That that gets tiresome after a certain amount of time. Um, but I'll I'll just take it back to kind of that that same idea. No, because you're looking at a sheet. You see how many lines there are. You know how much time that's booked for this. And there's work to be done. There is no time to think about that or is this mm -hmm. difficult for me. You're also really doing what you're being told to do from the director, right? You're not just sitting there doing everything you want to do. So there's somebody else. You do it once and they say, that was angry. What if you covered that anger a little bit more and gave me just a, a slower burn? Okay, then you do it that way. And then you think, all right. And then they say, all right, good, next. So they, it, you're really, really collaborating with other people's ideas and executing other ideas as well as your own ideas while you're working through sometimes a hundred, you know, a hundred cues. And that puts a different focus on it than the plot, which emerges when you watch it after you've. Uh, inserted the voices one at a time, then it emerges emerges in English as it has always or already been set up. But it feels that way because we're investing those each of those moments as fully as possible with the, the work that we're doing, even though that work seems separate from the plot, in that in a play or a movie, you would act those scenes out the whole way through not just one line at a time you know a lot of fans as well like even when i was doing like uh when i was posting the instagram stories for the q a uh -huh. uh, a lot of the repetitive questions were like what were your thoughts on neji's death because apparently you know this was huge when when i read the manga i was very upset seeing how he went um you know what, what were you thinking like were, right were you already, so i knew you... that that was coming right okay. go ahead what's the question Oh no! You pretty much answered. Like, we're, we're, did you know it was coming already? Like, seeing that his character was gonna that that the character was gonna go like that. Yeah. By then, enough people had said, "You know what happens, don't you?" Right. So I I, oh, okay. I knew that it was coming. And then every time they'd call with a booking, we would joke and I'd say, "Is this it?" And then uh, <laughs> Rita would say, or maybe even Sierra. I don't know. It would say, "Okay, this is it." And then. um and this we did at a different location. There's a couple of locations. Ironically, I worked there this morning, not at this location, but at that, for this same studio. And um, again, I wasn't thinking about the plot. I was like, okay, I've got to fulfill this mm -hmm. in just the right way so that this plays with an impact. So I knew that the death was coming. I also was like, well, it's been a good run. You know, you're thinking about how the, how you've just lost your job basically. Um, even though it's anime and I knew that. And in fact, there was like the very next week, I remember being back in the studio on a flashback. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, you die, but you don't die. Although I died and there were still a couple hundred more <laughs> episodes, you know, uh, so that's where it's you're coming from in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And even then, like you, you came back as Neji again in Boruto, you know, the sequel series. Yep. And you know, a lot of fans like that too. That just that little time travel arc, seeing how Boruto uh, got to meet all the the younger characters or how, the, the characters when they were young again. Um. So you know yeah. that that that's a big thing too. You know, just having characters come back because you know i forgot who i spoke about this with but they told me like one of the actors told me like you know you never know when you're going to come back for that role 
because the the show itself, the the writers, they can always bring someone back or change up a story. And I mean, or, you can never I mean, really just simply put as flashbacks. Yeah. And you just come back and vo- revoice the the character, which I thought that, yeah. that that's a nice touch for for actors as well, like to know that you know you may not be voicing that character again in the long run, but you can still come back and do again flashbacks. It might not. Time it's travel. not over when it's over. And then yeah. of course the video games, they're out of time, so they're not happening along the timeline of the show, and so they're still games uh, and so on. So you're you're lucky in anime that that kind of thing can happen. Unlike a lot of things where if your character dies, like I said, that's the, that's the end of your job as an actor. That's what you're thinking about. Your job just ended it's your last day of work. Now, you know, since, since we're on this topic as well, like with your job, like bleach is a big one that, you know, came back last year. Yeah. Like the, next, the, year. Next se- the next season's coming up this summer. You know, what was that like for you to come back as a uh, Hitsugaya? Um, it was funny sitting down there to do those records and looking at the characters and being like, wow, I've been here before. (laughs) This is, this is weird. Uh, it just, it just was funny to sit there doing bleach again. Like no time had passed is really what it felt like. Like no time had passed. And you know, and and then again with the summer, this especially this summer, like all these hot animes are coming up, and Bleach is one of them. You know, and, and you see how how your character has changed as well. Like again, we we've talked about it before how you're just working on how you're gonna execute these these ro- or the emotions of the character. But you know, seeing how how much hit do you feel like Hitsugaya has changed since the last time you voiced them, or do you think it's been the same? You know, hard to say. I don't know if you watch part one, but he's not really in it that much. Yeah. Um, in truth, when I get down to line counts and, and as you know, we're doing one line at a time, right. Or whatever. So I'm in, and for the first part, we were working from home or, you know, remotely. And so I bet my sessions weren't even 40 minutes long, maybe 45 minutes long. So the truth is I don't have a lot to say about what Toshiro has got going on in, um, in the first part of blood war, but, but we're getting ready to start part two. Right. And so there might be some more fun stuff coming up in, in part two, which we have not started working on yet. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I thought by now you guys be working on it already, but that, that's good to know too. That way I can, you know, keep off that topic. I don't want like NDAs or anything like that happening. Right. No spoilers. Well, I don't know anything about it. I do know that it feels, I think from what I understand, we'll be beginning that soon. And you can tell that from what's out in culture or what you see from the, uh, uh, original from the subs you know if they're out yeah i I know there was a a trailer that just recently dropped a few weeks ago and you know they're teasing a lot already with this upcoming season because the way how the first part ended where a lot the audience is expecting to see a lot more fights and and that's what we're really watching for when it comes down to bleach just yeah I, i if i think back to what i had done on part one which actually we haven't done in a while many months yeah um it was very talky. I was talking a lot. Yeah, it was definitely more like just plot plot building, especially. And then like also the way how they were building up the, the next group of villains. Uh, yeah. So it, it was really focused more on that. But I, I know for sure this coming season is going to be very right. They'll be impact. There'll be more. More stuff for sure. Yeah. But I, I wanted to ask you this as well, you know, um. Being a fan of Final Fantasy, I, I don't know if you remember doing this audition, but you also voiced uh, Kadaj from Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. And that movie came out when I was still very young. I was in, in grade school still. And I remember <laughs> like how big of a deal this movie was, especially being like CGI and for right. like, playing playing the game. You know, when you got this audition, or like, were you even aware of how big this game was at the time? I was because the the director casting director was someone who I know and work with. Right. And so that the subject of, of final fantasy had come up, uh, before in, in conversation, the audition, I'm trying to think, I, I don't, I don't think I remember that. It, yeah. That, it's been quite a while since the movie. <laughs> uh, if I went in somewhere 
or if maybe it was something I recorded and sent from home. Hmm. It, you know, it, it could have been something like that. But I do remember then when I booked it, the guy calling me and saying, OK, great, let's get this set up because. This is probably going to be something pretty popular because, as you know, Final Fantasy is a big deal and it's got a lot of fans, right? We discussed we discussed that before I went into work. And then when I got to work and saw, oh, this is a pretty big deal. They're taking this very seriously. And we're spending a lot of time on, on this and doing a lot of sessions. And so I, I got how, uh, at the time, you know, what a big deal it was. I know that with the movie, they also did like a re-release, like a complete version. Did you have to go back in studio and like re-record any like extra lines at all for that? Maybe I did. Maybe. I know I've been back in for what at one point was some kind of an amusement park ride. But uh, that does sound familiar. Like maybe I went back in to record some new content. But I, I don't remember. I do remember the re-release. And I went to a, you know, a screening for the 10 year anniversary a few years ago and, uh, and, and so on. So maybe we did add some dialogue in, but I don't, I'm not sure. Cause it could have also just been left over from what we did the first time around. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I, I only bring this up because I know that with, I don't know if you know, but like they, they've remade the game for like PlayStation four and PlayStation five. Yeah. I now. just, I did, um, uh, I, I don't know which game it was, but it was, I think, the most recent game. I, I did a lot of uh, parts in that. What is that? I did a lot of parts in the, uh, oh, that's my finger. <laughs> I, I, in the um, in, in the most recent game, the, the one you're thinking of, the humongous one. Okay. Maybe, like, from three years ago, two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's neat to come back and be part of that project again. As Although well, I wasn't to... Kadaj, right? It had nothing to right. do with that. I was like Guy 7 and this and that, and they were in a hurry to get all this recorded. And um, we worked on Thanksgiving. I oh, remember wow. that. They were really in a crunch to get this done. So, think... so yeah, being part of Final Fantasy, even more than just uh, Advent Children. Do you think... I mean, th this is just me asking you generally like do you think Kadaj will come back in the in the game at all no no in fact didn't he die though i mean i yeah, realized he... we just finished saying that you, you can doesn't matter but <laughs> but uh depending on the depending on the timeline no i i get the feeling he was who he was for that movie and it was sure fun to get to play the unhinged villain like that that was great. That was, and I'm happy with how that movie came out. You know, like I look at that and go, all right, I, that, that was good. I, I like how that, how that came out. Was that, was that a bit different for you than playing like a unhinged, unhinged villain like that versus like being like a, the more like good hero, heroic type character? I don't think so. Because I'm going to give you that same answer. Because once you get into the booth, then there's the work. Mm -hmm. And the work is always the same. It's interpreting lines on the paper <laughs> into reality. And there's more involved than just that label. So, yes, it was fun to play that villain. But villain, hero, whatever, there's a moment and you must fulfill it according to the parameters of the character and then the people that you're working with. The directors, I can't really overemphasize, even though I've mentioned it, how you're doing what they're telling you to do. You're not really originating. I mean, you are, but you're collaborating. So in the booth, the work is the way the work is. And that involves you, the director, and in the case of Final Fantasy, the people who were overseeing it from japan who would speak to the director through a translator a lot of cooks in the soup and then it comes back to you to do another take see which one they pick and then you see it through the magic of editing you know you might see take one take five take two take seven and then it looks no. like a, a movie but what we've been working on was now do it again like this. Now do it again where he's more angry. Now do it where he's angry but quieter. 
oh, that was too long. Do it again faster, you know? Do you think they were doing that because they just wanted, like, different takes on it to see what fit the best based on, like, your performance? All of that. They want to see what else is possible or they have an idea already in their head that they are waiting to hear come out of my mouth. All of that. But you don't know because you're in an isolated, quiet room. And you only hear when someone says, okay, now do it like this. So you're not in on that. They just have you do it again and again and again and again. And if I recall in Final Fantasy, it was again and again and again and again and again. Oh, wow. Every now, line. Even the reactions. Would you say that's... I, I know like with a lot of anime-based shows or movies, that there's a lot of like the... The action noises you had to do, like a lot of the grunting or like a lot of the the pushing or pulling, you know, was that something that came pretty easy to you as well? Or you had to like adjust to that as well? Uh, for whatever reason, that's easy for me. You just you got to teach yourself how to make sounds with your mouth, you know, all, all that. You got to just learn how to do it, learn how to make it sound real because you're obviously you're not really getting punched, but it has to sound real and invested and full and they all can't sound exactly the same so you've got to build up a catalog of uh, of expressions you know and that's part of the skill set involved yeah and especially with games you have to like did you find yourself like constantly re-recording for something like that too especially for, for video games yes but in games more it comes down to there's just hundreds of lines like 2000 lines so you give a couple of readings if the director likes it you move on there's just a lot to get through it takes hours and hours and those are really very expensive hours you know and so it needs to be executed cleanly and quickly because it isn't just about how it sounds or what i want it's about they have the budget that this is to be taken, be done in eight hours or whatever, you know? And so it, it has to get done. So there's not a lot of time to think about everything. There's just a lot of time to figure it out, execute it and move on. Not you Final know. Fantasy was different. They really right. took time on that because that was a movie. It was a huge movie in its sense that it of what it was and all that. But in other things, there are a lot of considerations about how it goes down in the booth, different from what it is you see when it's mixed and finished. The collaboration. Just the actor gets the attention because we're the one out in front. If you want to start your own podcast like Spoiler Force, then sign up with Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout has helped hundreds of thousands of users like me to begin their podcasting journey. With easy-to-use tools, you can effectively get your podcast into different platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, iHeartRadio, and more. You can view your stats, create audio clips, and even have your own podcasting website. Buzzsprout offers ideas, tips, tricks, and tutorials to help you improve your podcast. Follow the link below, and once you sign up, you'll get a $20 Amazon gift card. This will let Buzzsprout know that I sent you and will also support Spoiler Force Podcast. If you want a simpler way to record both video and audio for your podcast, then sign up with StreamYard. StreamYard is the perfect program to create podcasts, host live streams, and even do video calls. There are many tools that can help you create and design your own personal studio. You can screen share, read live comments, and stream to different destinations like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. You can also download your video and audio once you're done with your recording session. Follow the link below, and once you sign up with the basic or pro plan, you'll earn a $10 credit to use for StreamYard. Happy podcasting. I, I know that aside from acting, you've also done like voice direction and uh, some, some ADR work as well. Um, you know, working behind, like working instead of inside the booth, but behind the booth or in production, was that something that you were already working on beforehand, before you were acting, or was that was this something that came after? No, it was born of my acting career. A, my expertise in the field, right? I was a teacher for a casting director for a long time. I've always taken acting class, even after college, for 30 years taking acting class and singing lessons and all the things that keep my skills sharp. And so uh, starting to direct was really a, a seamless transition because I already knew what to do from the acting side. 
the beauty of doing it from the directing side is now I got to be the one to say how it goes and I got to do it how I wanted to do it. And it went when, how I said it was going to go. And so that part was, um, just a natural transition and, and pretty seamless and also something that I'm good at just because of the experience, you know? Yeah. I saw, I saw you also had like voice direction uh, credits for shows like Demon Slayer and Shield. Yes, Hero, I, like all um, these. I'm currently working on season three, which is premiering on, uh, I think Crunchyroll a little bit out of time, isn't it? In uh, English, a uh, Demon Slayer. Right. And then, um, uh, a lot of other shows, like what you said, I did a season of Seven Deadly Sins, Kakagurui, Gundam Build Divers, a show called Ico, a bunch of uh, hits, Promise Neverland, season one. How How is that process, like, versus, like, just, because now, cause now you're, like, in charge of, you're in charge of, like, who you're directing when it comes to the voices, right? Is that, is that what it really is? Or, or are you part of, like... Right. I am okay. in charge of specifically directing the American... Well, the English voice actors uh, in the recording process of making a dub, right? Someone else does the mixing and, uh, you know, other people do what they do. I deal with just the actors and recording the lines for their parts. So um, because I know what I'm doing on both sides of the glass it's easy for me to just know how I want that to sound and to get through, to get through it. Because now, again, there's a budget, there's a time, there's a time right. minimum. It, th these are expected to happen in a certain amount of time. Even when we're looking at two, 300 lines that has, it can't take forever. Now you, you don't, you, that, that means you're not like part of the casting either, right? You just know who's going to be there and who you're working it with. It depends on where you're working, right? Because in, in, in a way, a director is hired like an actor on one-off projects, right? Um, at, at Different companies handle it different. Where I uh, work, that is all taken care of by management who uh, takes it very seriously in terms of auditioning and picking the people in conjunction with our clients and then my only job is to pull performance and craft it kind of like a conductor into a symphony of voices and then it gets mixed down so how how is that like then working on like a show like for like demon slayer you know this being like an internationally huge show and you know there's so many like fans and dubs of this and do you feel like there was a lot of pressure on you when it came to, to like getting these voice lines down when you're uh in the booth for that i mean in a in a way but not really because like i said earlier it doesn't matter once you're in the booth the job is the same period mm -hmm. there is nothing different about it you're sitting there at the microphone you've got the script in front of you and your job is to interpret and my job is to interpret based on what i'm seeing and what i've been told are the expectations from me and then i create it to my satisfaction so of course i can understand your question about the pressure and the reality and understanding that th these are big popular things but it, but that does not change our work because our right. work is very specific about what needs to happen and our knowledge of how to make that happen is what it is and so i would say that pressure doesn't necessarily touch us we're just happy to be part of something cool that that is very uh new for me as well to, to hear that take on just like that production side of things because that that's something i like to learn as well when i speak with actors who are like doing more than just acting when it comes to the studio work because that, that's the stuff i don't know and that's that, that's what i like to learn or know as well when i that way when i do have like other guests on or bring back folks who are in that field i have more to speak with and uh you know the way how you like worded it it just makes it seem like you, there's like a certain way that's already been like it has to be done a certain way now like you don't have to worry too much about changing certain things there's like some sort of structure that you have with already when it comes to whether it's any anime really but the way how you're Doing right. This well, part. that's because it's a collaboration. Right. And our part is our part. There's the management part. There's the script part. <clears throat> there's the editing, the quality control of the writing. It comes to us as a script. Our job is to say those lines 
into the mouth of the character with feeling. And yes, I rewrite a lot of lines because things are different when it's an actor, but that's, that's just part of, of the work, but it's all been taken care of by other people whose job it is to do their part. And then it all gets put together and sound and then lo looks like a show and audience sees it all as one thing. Right. Right. Instead we've of like all, we've all each only done our very specific part. How, how did you come across Demon Slayer then? Like when it came to just voice direction, was this something that was like they, the manager oh, must uh, ask, ask you already for this? Yeah, I got an offer. We, <clears throat> I'd been uh, directing Demon Slayer though. That was probably like 2019 when I started Demon Slayer 17. So I'd been directing like maybe two or three years at that point. And, um, and it, I, I just got offered it. And, and, um, I think I got told at the time that it was pretty popular because it was already popular, right? Um, before it got dubbed and the movie was a huge hit in Japan, but that was after we started working on it and that had to do with COVID. So yeah, it just came to me <clears throat> as an offer from my, oh, wow. you know, from my people, from my associates. That is, it's very simple the way how you, how you word it. It just seems like they just contacted, Hey, do you want to take up this job? Like very simple. It's, this is instead of like, you know, um, I, I would, I, I thought it would be more like a, they kind of like select or do some sort of selection of like which director would fit best. In. I mean, I'm sure they did, but that would have been outside of my okay presence. I only know when the offer came in. So I'm sure they did have a discussion like that, but that's a management thing. And we're on, I'm not on the side of management. I'm on the artistic side because even though I'm the director, like I said, directors get ha handled like actors because directors and actors are the two sides of the same coin. It's not different except that I have to be there for everybody. Uh, so yeah, those are things handled by uh, management. And, um, Yes, I make it sound simple. It just was, you know, 20 years of a relationship, 30 years of a relationship building and people that I've known and worked with all the years of my career since I was young, you know. I think that's what's really neat too about the, especially when it comes down to like the, the dubbing community or the, just, just in general, like voice acting community, because a lot of folks who do know each other, like the networking and just knowing someone can get you into the right job or, you know, you guys all work together and on different projects too, which I think that's really neat to see how, how you're, like you just said, like how you're able to go and, and not just do voice acting, but also voice direction and then seeing different talent, meeting different talent. Right. <clears throat> and we're all know. connected. And the people who asked me to direct also were well, fully aware of me as an actor, which is <clears throat> what gave them, I'm sure the confidence to help, uh, usher me into directing as well thinking who could we get that's going to work out for us on all these levels you know it could have been a disaster although i didn't think it would ever think it would be because <laughs> like i said after teaching for a casting director for 18 years and um taking acting class and all this th th there wasn't it wasn't a situation that intimidated me at all you know, before we do get into some fan questions here, Steve, I did want to talk about your your con experience now that c conventions are, you know, coming back up again and, and you're getting booked for just appearances and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, was there, I guess, were you nervous at all coming back to cons at all, just doing that stuff? I mean, I, after COVID and all that? Not particularly, other than the way I have to uh, account for that in my life, you know, you got to get you got to go to an airport. You still have to sit there and wait. <laughs> you got to get on an airplane. You know, you, you have to do it. And so uh, it's more about fitting that in to my life in a, in a comfortable way than uh, I had any thoughts about, wow, it's all starting up again. And in was, fact, was I didn't really do that much before COVID anyway. Okay. Yeah, that was that was going to be the next question I was going to ask you. Like, were you going to cons before that? Because I know, like, there are some actors who never really did go to these events until you know post COVID or e even then. Like, just these there are so many anime events coming up, whether you're in California or Texas or you know. Just, I've been it, to I I had been to a couple events prior to COVID, like years before, on an invite basis, and then now it's just a more popular 
thing because uh, people who want to put these events together because they know that their local people who have no other access are interested in it. And it's good advertising as well as a business opportunity for them. And then we are the, uh, what do you want to say? The, what they're selling. And you've been to some recently as well, right? Because I know that when we were exchanging emails, I know you said you were pretty busy with like, especially summertime being a big, the season for conventions. Yeah, it comes up. Like I just had a fun uh, day in Seattle this weekend at a, at a uh, killer store called Unlock the Con. And me and uh, Steve Kramer, who plays, I can't, I, I heard it all weekend long and now I can't remember. <laughs> the Lieutenant in Naruto. And um, we... I had a great time up there meeting everybody. It's what's why I said the people with tattoos because a woman showed me her Naruto tattoo and um, ha had an enjoyable time uh, being part of that and then coming home. So, yeah, I going up to I think it's in Watsonville in California in a couple of weeks with an actor named Paul St. Peter and others. I think Abby Trot's going to be there. I don't remember who else, but we're going up to a one day event in in uh, Northern California. So th those are fun to get to meet people and get to um, receive good wishes from people for a job that you did for half an hour in a dark booth one time 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I do want to get to some fan questions here before we, before I do wrap up this episode here. So I do have right. a few. Um, so let's see, let me get to this first one here from um, a good friend of mine, Van Brooks. He asks, um, let's see, he, he has a two part question. Let me just pull up this his first part. Okay. Uh, if I can find it, what the hell? <laughs> uh, give me sorry about this, Steve. Hold on, give me. A few no, I get here. it. It's it's always like that. That's how it is. You think you have it, and then you scroll, scroll. And then you scroll and then you're like, oh, my God, where is it? People are waiting. <laughs> People are watching. What should I do? All right. So this first this first part of the question, uh, he asks, do you follow boxing? And so who is your favorite boxer? Uh, Ipo Makina Uchi is my favorite <laughs> boxer. And other than that, no, I do not follow boxing. But I do love ha Hajime no Ipo. And I love that Michael B. Jordan was – showing us some love as he was going around doing press tour for Creed, uh, talking about his interest in anime and in uh, fighting spirit, which is what we call it in English, you know. And uh, this, the second question he asks, uh, Van Brooks asks is, um, you know, now that there's such things as like influencer boxing going on, you know, like the whole Jake Paul thing, he, <laughs> he asks if they reach out to voice actors, would you ever consider stepping in the ring? <laughs> Maybe if it was against Marjorie Taylor Greene, I would step into the <laughs> ring. Uh, but, uh, I mean, how's this? I, I, no, but you never know. If someone presented me with something kind of funny, you never know what's going to happen. But, you know, <laughs> I guess it comes uh, down to the money. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Like, you don't want to just go in there and get beat Kick up for my no ass reason. kick, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, this uh, the next question I have is from uh, Mighty Pegasus. He's another friend of mine as well. Um, he asks, uh, being part of the, hold on, let me just see how he worded this. Oh, he asks, uh, does the Dempsey roll really work in real life? Uh, I I feel from what I understand, it is a real thing. I might be wrong, uh, but it sure is significant. People do often refer to the Dempsey role when they're asking me to sign a picture of Epo often, or they'll talk about how they practiced the Dempsey role when they were a kid while they were watching fighting spirit and, and that kind of thing. So, so yes, let's say the Dempsey role is real. All right. So this next one I have is from uh, my friend Julian from what's in my head podcast. He asks uh, if you could voice or direct anyone or if you could voice or direct any character or show, what would it be? Wow. I don't know. Um, I, I guess I would say something with a lot of episodes. <laughs> Is that <laughs> self-serving enough? Uh, I don't have any particular dream, um, nor do I have a particular dream of directing any kind of 
a actor per se, you know, like a celebrity or, or, or anything, I'm more happy just to be working. Uh, let's see here. I think he had another so right, part two. Okay. Yeah. A lot of these guys had like two part questions. Yeah. So, uh, he asks, uh, if you could voice any character from any anime, who would it be? And what do you think they would sound like? I don't know. I mean, the, I guess the characters that I've done and we find out what they sound like after I, uh, <laughs> after I act them out. Um, uh, at this point, I like characters like um, McGillis in uh, Gundam Iron Blooded Orphans, who doesn't have to just barely talks above a whisper the whole time. That's the kind <laughs> of character that I like. Not do screaming. You think, do, do you think when you voice certain characters, did you feel like you were voicing them in the, I guess, in the same way or same style? Or was, was there characters that you thought that you could voice a little bit differently than how you did? I mean, maybe I I would consider that, but since they're each their own unit of time, you know, it's hard to say what I would have done given like what I said, that there's a lot of people telling you what to do. So there's only, mm -hmm. only so much leeway that you have once they've dialed it into what it is they want to hear. And then, you know, you've got someone saying, oh, it's getting a little high, get a little high, try to settle it down a little bit more, you know. Oh, okay. You kind of have to do what other people are telling you to do in addition to your own creativity. It's a process, right? But uh, so I don't know. I, I mean, I, I suppose I could watch anything and say, oh, I would do that differently, especially some of the stuff from when I was young and I didn't really know enough about dubbing. But, but I don't know what I would change. Well, Steve, as we wrap up here, Thank you so much for your time. I I, I really learned a lot. I, I know that a lot of these questions may have seemed like repetitive, and, and maybe you maybe you felt like you were repeating your answer quite a bit in this episode. But I I learned a lot, honestly. Like this was a whole new take on just the acting side for me. I have no acting experience, so hearing all of this is really cool. Just seeing this technical stuff, and then hearing your directing experience, and just learning all this it was very knowledgeable. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, uh. I'm glad we had a chance to go in some of those uh, directions to talk about things on a maybe on a different level than I I would otherwise talking about these shows uh, this time. So I'm glad that we were able to talk about some of those things that maybe that perspective you haven't heard yet. Yeah, I, I, I like I said, it's very I appreciate that a lot because you know I I know that some podcasts tend to like ask. You know the same stuff, and I know that a lot of these actors have these answers memorized, or they they kind of just give you what they generally already would say to these questions. But learning this, man, like I said, Steve, you're very knowledgeable in your field and the experience, the way how you speak shows, and it's really cool just to see how how much like knowledge you have in this in this field, and just the way how you were able to explain your your job. So anyone who's listening, I hope like they learn a lot from you, and they if, whenever they see you at a con or something, they could probably bring that up and talk to you about that too. Yeah, uh, uh, use that as a way into the conversation. Or I heard something interesting that I didn't know about. You know how it how a, an actor has to approach a role in the context of their day to day life, not just the show that we see on TV. Now, uh, for fans and followers who do want to follow you, how can they do that as well? I um, am on Instagram. I think it, it's just Steve Staley there. And at uh, Twitter, I think I'm Staley Bud. Uh, I do have a Facebook, but I rarely log on to Facebook for whatever reason. So uh, if you hit me there on Messenger or whatever, it probably would be a minute. But Facebook and, I mean, uh, IG and Twitter... I spend a lot of time. IG, I look through a lot and occasionally post pictures. Twitter, I just mumble around and spend a lot of time on politics on Twitter. But it is a way uh, for for people to have access. Cool. And then I'll have those links in the, the show notes and all that. That way fans and followers can uh, follow you and all right. uh, look yeah. at your, your future projects and see what cons you're going to. But again, right. I Steve, do tweet out and uh, the Instagram if I'm going to a con or whatever. So people in that area might know it if they weren't aware 
Yeah. And um, but yeah, but thank you so much, man. Again, this is this was an amazing uh, conversation. I really appreciate your time. Um, in the future, if you ever want to come back on the show and just like talk about your other the the other things that you do in the field, I'd love to have you back on. Well, that's great. Thanks again for inviting me. I I uh, had a great time. So right on. Spoiler force. See you guys later. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to give a review and rate Spoiler Force Podcast. If you want to get all Spoiler Force updates or even peeks at behind the scenes, you can join the Spoiler Force Discord community. And if you'd like to show support, give tips, recommendations, sponsorships, or any collaborations, you can email me at rickyvang92 at gmail.com.